special TV12 production, Freedom's Edge, African Americans in Delaware, is made possible in part by the Delaware Humanities Forum. The winds filling the sails of the Swedish ship Vogel Grip carried more than sailors returning to their newly established colonial home, Fort Christina. Also on board were supplies crucial to survival in the New World. Cargo, which included an enslaved man, the Swedish settlers called Black Anthony. Anthony had worked in both Africa and the West Indies. Now forced to move to yet another continent, Anthony would become the first black man to live in the colony New Sweden, and the first slave to work the land destined to become Delaware. Anthony's labor helped those early settlers stay alive, and over time, it's believed, they set him free from slavery. Once free, legend says, Anthony chose to return to sea, sailing the personal ship of Swedish governor, Johann Prince. Thousands of men and women would arrive in Delaware, like Anthony, brought as slaves, working toward their freedom. Some would reach their goal, others would die in bondage. But all would learn the cruel lessons of a land where their dignity was an afterthought. The land of Delaware, freedom's edge. Oh, freedom, oh, freedom, oh, freedom over me, over me. And before I be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free. When colonial settlers first looked over the fields and forests of Delaware, they saw a way to make their fortune. All they needed was a plot of land and someone to work it. Land wasn't hard to come by. Dutch, Swedish, and English settlers made deals with Native Americans to buy large plots of the New World. Labor, on the other hand, was a problem. To make a profit, colonial farmers needed help from someone who'd work very cheap or free. They first turned to Native Americans, even tried to enslave them. But Native American men weren't accustomed to field work, and they could easily escape from white men to hide among other Indian peoples. More Native American women were enslaved, but many died from diseases like smallpox that Europeans had brought with them. So the colonists turned to the system they'd used back home, the poorest people around, poverty-stricken Europeans, sometimes sold themselves into bondage just long enough to pay off their debts. These temporary slaves were known as indentured servants. Indentured servants were servants who couldn't pay their way over to the New World and a ship captain would pay their way for them and then would sell their services for approximately five years to someone who wanted to buy them. One of the problems with indentured servants, of course, was that they only worked for three to seven years. And once they were free from their indenture, then they probably went on to do something else and probably most of them left the state of Delaware. Europeans were desperate for a labor force to work dozens of colonies, not just Delaware. Swedish, Dutch, Portuguese, Spanish, and English ships all sailed through the Atlantic Ocean to a place long rumored to have unlimited resources, the west coast of Africa. Europeans would take about 12 million men, women, and children from West African countries, shipping many off to the Caribbean, others to the eastern shores of the Americas. One African man wrote, the trip was not just physically grueling, but mentally horrifying as well. He was brought down to the coast, had his first view of the Atlantic Ocean, which was traumatic enough for him, his first view of a huge slave ship, which was also traumatic for him, his first view of a white person, had never seen a white person before, is taken on the deck and sees hundreds of other blacks chained together, all of them having these miserable expressions on their face. And he concluded that he was about to be eaten alive. 
fell on the unconscious. The only records of Africans who arrived in Delaware during the 16 and 1700s are sales receipts and a few newspaper accounts. One tells of an 18-year-old girl who stepped off a slave ship docked in Newcastle. She spoke no English and wasn't allowed to keep her African name. The man who bought her called her Betty. Newspapers tell the story of another African in Newcastle, a man who defiantly kept his African name, Kanga Mochu. In halting English, Kanga Mochu told people stories about his home across the ocean and the wives he longed to see again. Many Africans believe that when they died, their spirits would cross back over the Atlantic Ocean, finally making it home. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child a long way from home. The 18th century saw dramatic growth in the three counties of Delaware. Colonists settled in, raising children and building homes. Big farmhouses surrounded by tobacco fields, corn crops, and wheat, designed to look like stately English manors. Lawyer and gentleman farmer John Dickinson owned one of the most impressive mansions around, a huge brick farmhouse with brightly painted doors and shutters, set on a flourishing plantation just south of Dover. The Dickinson family didn't run that place alone. As many as 60 slaves worked on the property, laboring from sunup to sundown with no pay, just food and a place to sleep. John Dickinson could look out one of his mansion windows and see the accommodations he'd made for the people whose sweat and toil supported his elegant lifestyle. Small wooden shacks with a dirt floor and very little furniture. A big contrast to the big house, but no one was worried about keeping things fair. This wasn't a business arrangement. This was slavery. And my grandmother was a little girl. She was a slave girl. And she, her name was Adeline, and the missus called her Addie. The lady said to her, Ad, I don't know how I'm going to get the eggs from under the house. The chickens went under the house and laid eggs, and she was small to get in this, around this, under the house and get it and bring them out. Slavery in Delaware was an economic system designed to get the most work out of every black man, woman, and child. Enslaved people grew up learning the many jobs that best suited their age and strength. Women could cook, clean, sew, farm, and take care of white children. Men spent years of their lives in fields and years more chopping and hauling wood. If you could imagine a life with no money, no last name, scraps for clothes, and scraps for dinner, you have a rough idea of slavery. But it was worse than that. It was a mess. It was a mess. It's a mess. It was a mess. We are, we are climbing, 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 Enslaved men and women kept their sanity and their spirits alive with religion, taking comfort in the hope of a heaven they'd reach after death. The spirituality of African Americans suggests that uh, uh, there was another way, and that this pretty much kept the, the spirit of the, the slave going in order to survive uh, American society. Slave owners preferred in a regular church service to read certain parts of the Bible to their slaves. Those parts of the Bible that stressed such messages as, you know, servants obeying their masters and what have you. When slaves met and conducted their own services in secret, that wasn't the passage they read. They read passages about Moses leading the people of Israel out of bondage. They read stories about uh, David defeating Goliath, stories that stressed being rescued from some major 
uh, a problem, like slavery, for example. Rescue would remain a dream for most of Delaware's black population in the colonial period. Slavery was such a profitable system to white colonists that they invested heavily in human purchases. In 1770, almost one of every four people in Delaware was a black slave, denied the chance to read, write, or formally marry. There's little historical record of their lives. After many years of, of tracing, trying to put the puzzles together of our genealogy, you can almost feel my anxiety when I went to the Hall of Records on the, the oak table and uh, looking through the documents and the will of John Bloxon and reading down where he willed his cakes of nails to his daughter or, and his slave Millie to another daughter and his, and his, and his, uh, his slave Harry and down to Spencer was along with nails and cows and furniture. You know, I pounded the desk. I was so angry, tears came into my eyes. To know that my ancestor, human beings, was listed as worth being as much as a horse or a keg of nails or whatever. It took a war to shake up the institution of slavery in Delaware. Not the Civil War, though. It was the American Revolution that would forever change the lives of African Americans in the first state. The Revolution was one of those events that not only caused people to act, but caused people to think. If you thought about the king as enslaving white colonists, then the implications were that maybe this slavery was extending beyond white colonists to black colonists, and maybe the people doing the enslaving were not the king of England, but people living on this side of the Atlantic Ocean. That was troubling. The Declaration of Independence may have inspired some white farmers to consider freeing their slaves, but it was a pinch on their pocketbooks that convinced many to actually do it. The Revolutionary War had disrupted international markets for corn and wheat, and that meant a cut in profits for Delaware farmers. Keeping a number of slaves only added to their expenses, and masters started seeing slaves as a burden instead of an investment. In the decades after the American Revolution, hundreds of slaves walked into this room, the Kent County Recorder of Deeds Office. They took a seat while white owners filled out manumission forms, the paperwork of freedom. No more auction block for me, no more, no more. No more auction block for me, many thousand gone. <laughs> Meanwhile, upstairs, in the Delaware legislative chambers, state lawmakers were debating whether to go ahead and outlaw slavery. After all, by 1790, a majority of slave owners in the state had already given up their human property voluntarily. Several times, uh, the abolition bill got very close to being passed. On two occasions, the abolition bill failed by only a single vote. One vote. States north of the Mason-Dixon line were much less hesitant when it came to abolition. Vermont became the first state to outlaw slavery in 1777. Massachusetts and Pennsylvania soon followed. By the early 1800s, freedom's boundaries extended throughout the north. Delaware, still a slave state, was right on the edge. He breaks the power of canceled sin. He sets a prisoner free. By the early 1800s, the fervor of Methodist preachers stirred up even more anti-slavery feelings in Delaware. Quakers, too, although a bit quieter by nature, waged a sometimes public, sometimes secret war against human bondage. One Quaker man, a Wilmington merchant named Thomas Garrett, was a master at sneaking runaway slaves north through Delaware to the free states. His story and stories of many other Underground Railroad conductors, like the legendary Harriet Tubman, were told in a book written by a man named William Still in 1872. Those hunted fugitives were determined to have liberty, even at the cost of life. On the road, a poor mother with her travel-worn family became desperately alarmed, fearing that they were being betrayed in terror lest the bloodhound should be at their heels. 
but God provided better things for her, and she was lucky to fall into the right hands. Occasionally, Philadelphia abolitionists like this man, Samuel Burris, would venture into Delaware trying to help runaways make it up to Philadelphia. In the winter of 1847, Burris was caught and brought to trial for assisting three fugitive slaves. After a guilty verdict, Delaware courts told Burris he'd be sold into slavery himself for 14 years as punishment. And once he was on the auction block, he began to contemplate 14 years of slavery, probably in Louisiana or Mississippi or some deep southern state. It was a horrible thing to think about. But little did he know that Isaac Flint, a Quaker abolitionist, was out among the crowd of buyers and was going to bid for him. When the bidding started, a man from Baltimore, a slave buyer from Baltimore, made the highest bid, but Isaac Flint walked up to him and whispered in his ear, I'll give you $100 if you back off. The buyer backed off. Isaac Flint then bought Samuel Burris, and Samuel Burris was whisked away to his family, his waiting wife, and his children in Philadelphia. And he never went south of the Mason-Dixon line again. The Cypress Swamp at Trescent's Pond near the town of Laurel is one of the most beautiful plots of land in Delaware. And in the early 19th century, it was owned by one of the most successful men in the state. Entrepreneur Levin Thompson built a sawmill and a grist mill at the pond. He employed 20 free blacks and lent money to needy white landowners around him. One of Sussex County's wealthiest men, Levin Thompson, an African-American surprised whites that a black man, even one who had never learned to read or write, could find success in Delaware. A hard-fought success, not easily repeated. The entrepreneurial spirit took hold of northern Delaware, too, as a man named L. Uthier Irene DuPont opened a gunpowder factory on the banks of the Brandywine River in 1802. Working families welcomed this industrial revolution to Delaware, but social conditions at the time meant not every working family got a piece of the action. Free blacks were shut out of the highest skilled factory jobs and forced to support their families using many of the creative skills they'd learned in earlier centuries. Blacksmithing, cooking, catering, carpentry, and shipbuilding became the way some black families made a living. In lower Delaware, still agricultural for the most part, Families learned to get by with farming skills, but it wasn't easy. They were not first-class citizens. The state put them in that second-class citizenship category by passing a series of laws known as black codes. For example, blacks were required to have, quote-unquote, gainful employment, which translated into, uh, you needed to be employed by a white person. The Black Codes were Delaware's early version of what came to be known in the South as Jim Crow laws. They were rules that white lawmakers created to control free blacks. And Delaware had a higher percentage of free blacks than any state in the country. It shall not be lawful for free Negroes to possess a gun. Negroes may not gather in groups after 10 o'clock in the evening. No Negro may be idle. There will be no intermarriage between Negroes and whites. Delaware's black codes covered education, too. No African-American child was allowed to attend a state-funded school. That ruled out nearly every school in Delaware. And segregation infected religious communities as well, causing some African-American Christian leaders, like former slaves Richard Allen and Absalom Jones, to consider starting their own congregations. Not only were they assigned the worst seats, they could only come to the altar after the white worshipers had come. And uh, they, uh, Alan and Absalom Jones and others, began to feel that this was wrong. Uh, they had read the Declaration of Independence and had come to believe that uh, it applied to just white people. And they felt that it was wrong to religious, to worship God in this way. While Richard Allen and Absalom Jones started the first independent black churches in Philadelphia, a Delawarean named Peter Spencer was feeling the same need to break off from a segregated Methodist church in Wilmington. The slaves always worshipped upstairs. They didn't worship downstairs with their master. So they were making so much noise 
that the officials asked them to keep quiet or do something else. So Peter Spencer decided to get a church of his own. Spencer became famous for starting a string of churches named the Union Church of African Members. They were meant to support free blacks and the few men and women that remained enslaved in Delaware. Each church had a school, and that's where the children in the vicinity of the church could go to school. By the Civil War years, African Americans in Delaware were ready to fight to end slavery in their own state and across the nation. President Abraham Lincoln found it strange that a state which sided with the Union still refused to outlaw slavery. He even offered to pay the remaining few white owners to let go of their human property. But those owners, like Delaware's once governor, William Ross, held tight to their plantation-style system. The system was blown apart by the end of the war in 1865. The United States government passed the 13th Amendment, outlawing slavery in every American state. Still, the first state to ratify the U.S. Constitution was nearly the last state to formally accept abolition. Not until 1901, when the Republicans came to power, did they go back and ratify the amendment. Of course, by that time, slavery had already been abolished. To be free, that was the day that they were proud of but they were no better off than they were under slave. They were in the same predicament, but they were just free. Free for what? They still had to do work like they did before, for nothing. The rising racism in Delaware that reached a peak just before the Civil War continues to poison the water in Delaware in terms of race relations. And in Delaware, it's not until 1967 that the last segregated school is finally closed. It would be a long journey for Delaware's African Americans, one filled with struggle for dignity and equality. But in 1865, African Americans still celebrated. Freedom was a good place to start. Free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty that I'm free at last. We are, we are climbing, climbing Jacob's ladder. We are climbing, climbing Jacob's The special TV-12 production, Freedom's Edge, African Americans in Delaware, is made possible in part by the Delaware Humanities Forum.